I know some of you thought I was going to say Matthew, but I'll tell you why I didn't say Matthew. But anyway, 1 Corinthians, we're going to go there, the seventh chapter, beginning at verse 7 through verse 16. 1 Corinthians, the seventh chapter, uh, starting at the seventh verse, verse 7 verse through the 16th verse. If you have it, please stand for the reading of God's Word. 1 Corinthians, the seventh chapter, we're going to start at the seventh verse through the 16th verse. I'll be reading from the New King James Version of the Bible. Once again, 1 Corinthians, the 7th chapter, starting at verse 7 through 16. And he says as follows, For I wish that all men were even as myself, but each one has his own gift from God, one in this manner and another in that. But I say to the unmarried and to the widows, it is good for them if they remain even as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. Now to the married, I command, yet not I but the Lord, a wife is not to depart from her husband. But even if she does depart, let her remain unmarried or reconciled to her husband. And a husband is not to divorce his wife. Verse 12. But to the rest, I, not the Lord, say, if any brother has a wife who does not believe and she is willing to live with him, let him not divorce her. And a woman who has a husband who does not believe if he is willing to live with her, let her not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife. And the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Otherwise, your children will be unclean, but now they are holy. But if the unbeliever departs, let him depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases. But God has called us to peace. Last verse, verse 16. For how do you know, O wife, whether you will save your husband, or how do you know, O oh husband, whether you will save your wife? Amen. You may be seated. I'd like to preach just for a few minutes from the subject, Why Did I Get Married? Part 3. <laughs> Why did I get is for a word of prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you once again for allowing us to study your word. Open up our spiritual understanding as we prepare to hear from you, hear from what your scripture says. And Lord, allow us to place this message into our hearts that it may make a mark on us that can never be erased, that we can be taken into our families, into our neighborhoods, into our community, that we can tell the dying world that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. Amen. Now, we are in the last message on uh, the, the subject of marriage. And let me tell you how we got there to this subject. Remember, we are in a series called The Ministry of Jesus Christ. So what we're doing is we're going through the Gospels uh, in chronological order, and we are just preaching straight through the Gospels. Well, we got to the point where Jesus is preaching from his most famous sermon in the world called The Sermon on the Mount which covers uh, Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. Well, we got to the point in Matthew 5, verse 31 and 32, where Jesus talks about divorce and remarriage, or in divorce and marriage. And so, uh, because we got there, I, I knew that this subject was very important, so I said, I, I don't want to just go quickly and preach one message on that. I wanted us to take our time. So that's what we did. The first message we dealt with marriage from that verse, we gave you the basic foundation of marriage. And then in the second marriage, we came, second sermon, we came back and told you what the Old Testament had to say about marriage, divorce, and remarriage. And today, we're going to conclude this series with what the New Testament has to say about marriage, divorce, and remarriage. So let's, let's go there and see what's happening. Now, in 1 Corinthians, uh, uh, Paul is preaching to the Corinthian church, and I want you to understand about the Corinthian believers. Of course, they are Greek-speaking people, which means when these saved people, 
people got saved, they are being saved from what? They are being saved from their culture. And their culture was a pagan Greek background. So they had a lot of different beliefs about marriage. They had a lot of different beliefs about relationships. So one of the, the factors is this. Some of the questions came up probably among these uh, Corinthian believers now are saved. Here are some of the questions, and it may be your question as well. Is marriage a command from God? Do you have to be married to please God? Should singles get married, or is it more spiritual to stay single? Should married people who become Christians abstain from any kind of physical intimacy? Should a Christian married to a non-Christian have any children? Now, we're going to cover all that in this passage of scripture that you just read, verse 7 through uh, verse 16. But in order for us to get, get there, let me give you a brief overview of the first seven verses. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7 so you don't think you're going to miss out. Well, in the first seven verses, what Paul was talking about is this. Marriage is normal. It is normal. Marriage is for the majority of the people on this planet. It is, not, it is, it is the majority. Marriage is good. But guess what? Marriage is not for everybody. I want to tell you that. Yes, it's good. Yes, it's the majority of the people on the planet. And it is normal, but it's not for everyone. And that means this. If you are not married, then you must be single. Now, I would say this. And if you're single, then you must be celibate. I'm talking about Christians. Now, uh, if you don't know what that word celibate means, you got to look that up. But let me, no, no, celibate means that you're not having any physical intimacy with the opposite sex. You're celibate. You're celibate. Now, God has given some people the gift to be single. You have to have a gift to be single because everybody's not going to be single. You are not, and being single means you are not cohabitating, you are not sleeping with anybody, you have dedicated your life to God. That's what singleness is. So why did God create marriage in the first place? God created marriage to do one thing, number one, bring a husband and wife together, but he also created marriage to avoid fornication. Fornication, we're going to run into that word again and I'll explain it there. But I'm going to talk about four groups. There's four groups that are talked about in this passage from verse 7 through 16. Now, in the other two sermons that I preached on marriage, we really dealt with divorce itself and we dealt with the married people. But today, because this is the conclusion of it, guess what? We're not going to miss anybody today. We're going to cover every aspect of singleness, marriage, divorce, and remarriage. And they're going to fall into one of these four groups. The first group we're going to talk about is single people. The second group we're going to talk about is married people, both both of the married couples, the husband and wife, they're saved. We're going to talk about a saved couple. The third group we're going to talk about is a saved Christian who uh, is married to an unbeliever, but the unbeliever wants to stay in a marriage. And then the fourth group we're going to talk about is a saved person who is married to an unbeliever, and the unbeliever wants to leave. Wants a divorce. Those are the four groups we're going to talk about. Let's deal with the first group first. First group is found in verse 7 through 9. First group 7 through 9. And let us look at that again. He says this in verse 7 through 9. For I wish that all men were even as I myself. But each one has his own gift from God. One in this. Paul said, I wish that all men, we're talking about single people, I wish that all men were as myself. What was Paul at this point? He was single. Has Paul ever been married? Uh, most likely, yes. Because before Paul was a Christian, he was, he, he was a part of the Sanhedrin court. And in order to be a part of the Sanhedrin court, you had to be married. So evidently, he probably was married, but his, his wife passed away, and therefore he became single again. So when he says, I want everyone, I wish everybody to, to, to be like me, he said, I want people to be single. Now what is he talking about? Look at verse 8. In verse 8 he says, but I say to the unmarried and to the widows, 
it is good for them if they remain even as I am. Now, you got to get the right perspective on this when he talks about marriage. He's talking to who? He's talking to the widows. He's talking to the divorced. The divorce who divorce the right way. There is a right way and there is a wrong way to divorce. The right way to divorce is this. You divorce someone because they were unfaithful to you. That's the only reason in the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, for a divorce. The wrong way to divorce is uh, I divorce her because I don't like the wig she wears. I divorced her because she gained weight. I divorced her because she can't cook like my mama can. I divorced any other reason. I don't care what reason you come up with. It's wrong. The only reason that the Bible gives you for the grounds of divorce is unfaithfulness. And I talked about the beating. If so, what if somebody beating on me? What if he cussing me out? What if, if somebody's doing something to the children? We're going to talk about that too because we talked about that just a little bit last time. But watch this. He says this. He's only talking to who? Those who've done it the right way in verse 8. Now look at verse 9. It is good for them if they remain even as I am. Verse 9. But if they cannot exercise self-control, let them marry. For it is better to marry than to burn. Now listen to this. Uh, single people, don't listen to people who want to quickly rush you into marriage. You don't have to be rushed into marriage. People tell you, like, well, you know, you need to get married because your biological clock is ticking. You know, you need to get married uh, because you're getting older. You need to get married because if you don't get married, you're going to be lonely. You're going to be an old man. That is not true. Don't, listen, you get married when you want to get married. Don't let nobody pressure you into marriage. And once then, he said this, I wish that everybody was like me. I wish that most of you all were like me. What was Paul? Single. I wish most people were single, but I already know everybody can handle singleness. That's what he's saying. God has given some people the gift of singleness, which is celibacy. And single people can stay single if they can stay celibate. If you can't stay celibate, stop saying you single. You need to get married. If you cannot stay with the Lord by yourself without an intimate relationship with the opposite sex, you need to be married. Okay, you, you might not believe me. Drop down to verse 25. Go all the way down to verse 25, this same chapter. Verse 25. I didn't make this up. He said it. Now concerning virgins, that's single people, I have no commandment from the Lord. Yet I give judgment as one whom the Lord uh, in his mercy have made trustworthy. I suppose, therefore, that this is good because of the present distress, that it is good for a man to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be loosed. Are you loose from a wife? Do not seek a wife. But even if you do marry, you have not sinned. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. Nevertheless, such will have trouble in the flesh, but I would spare you. You're like, what in the world is he talking about? Listen, the reason I think we have so many mixed up uh, uh, definitions about marriage is because people don't go into great detail to find out what the scripture is talking about. What is Paul talking about here? Listen, remember we're talking about Greek people. In Paul's day, in the Corinthian church, there was a false teaching that went around. And the false teaching was this. When Jesus died on the cross and you got saved, now Christ wants every born-again person to be celibate. This is a false doctrine. Every Christian got to be celibate and dedicate their life to God. And if you are married and you accept Jesus Christ, then you got to get a divorce from your husband and your wife. He got to be celibate. She got to be celibate so we all can worship and praise God. That was a teaching in the Corinthian church. And Paul goes on in verse 25 and says, no, that is.
He says this in verse 27 again. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be loosed. Are you loosed from her? Do not seek a wife. In other words, if you are bound or if you're married, don't let nobody tell you you have to divorce from your wife if it's the wrong way. He says, don't let nobody tell you you're divorced because of this reason and that reason. And we're going to go deeper into that and why we should work, uh, divorce. But watch this. He's talking about the principle of marriage. There's already a lot of pressure on single people already. Because everything that they see in this society is surrounded by sexuality. So there's already a lot of pressure on them. But Paul's saying this, if you are single and you want to get married, go on ahead and get married. But don't walk around and say you're single and you're sleeping around with somebody. Because you're not. You have not committed yourself. You've got to commit yourself to one or the other. Either you're going to be single or you're going to get married. He's going to give you a reason why. Watch this. Another one. You say, well, no, that's not good enough for me. Here's another passage about single people. Go to Matthew 19. To show you that marriage and singleness is a gift from God. Matthew 19. Uh, don't lose 1 Corinthians because we've got to come back here. But Matthew 19 Start at verse, I think verse 7, maybe verse 7, let me find it first. Verse 19, and it's also talking about singleness. Where does this singleness come from? This gift of singleness come from? This is Jesus talking. In Matthew 19, I think he says in verse 7, let's see, no, let's, start, let's start with verse 9. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, Except for fornication, we're going to talk about that in a minute, and, and marries another commits adultery. And whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. Verse 10, his disciples said to him, if such is the case of the man with his wife, it is better not to marry. But Jesus said, that's all he said to them, all cannot accept this saying but only those to whom it has been given. Now, it's very important. Watch verse 12. This is singleness. This is the gift of singleness. For there are eunuchs. What is a eunuch? Uh, he's going to explain to you. But I want to say singles for right now. For there are eunuchs who were born thus for the, from their mother's womb. So there are people who are born with the gift of singleness. There's eunuchs. That means you're not having any type of relationship with the opposite sex intimate relationship that is and there are eunuchs singles who were made eunuchs by men a uh, good word for that is castration if you want to remember that word and there are eunuchs who have been made watch this here's the key one there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs single people for the kingdom of heaven's sake somebody made a vow to say, I'm not going to get married. I want to stay single. Being talking about single. I'm going to stay single. I'm going to stay celibate for the rest of my life. There are some people who have made that vow. The Catholic Church uh, calls them nuns and priests. But the nuns and priests in the Catholic Church, a lot of them, if you listen to some of the stories that they tell you, they wanted to be a preacher, they wanted to be a priest or a nun in the Catholic Church, but they did not necessarily want it to be single. But because they had the desire to be a preacher and they wanted to be a part of the church, they knew that's the only way that they could become a preacher or a nun, that they had to be celibate for the rest of their life. They went ahead and did it. Now, watch this. You shouldn't join the ministry if you go to a church that tells you that you can't get married and you want to get married. You better find a ministry that you know you can get married in and be a part of that ministry because as you know, what happened in the Catholic Church, we saw all kinds of abuse because they really didn't take a vow on the inside. They may have made a vow to the church that they were going to be celibate, but behind closed doors, no, they weren't celibate at all. So watch this. If you're going to make the vow that you're going to be a single person for the rest of your life, that got to be a gift from God. And that's why I started off that 99.9% of people on this planet should be married. Because 99% of the people on this planet uh, like to be in relationships with other people. 
So, but there are that few that do make a vow that they will not get married. That's singleness. Now, here, watch, watch what he says you know, about this singleness. Uh, go back to uh, 1 Corinthians uh, verse 9. What do singles do then? What do singles do? Verse 9 tells you what to do. Uh, in 1 Corinthians, he says this in verse 9. How do you handle singleness? But if they cannot exercise self-control, if you cannot stay away from the opposite sex, what do you do? Get married. No, not shack up. Uh-uh. He didn't say that. No, not sleep around with other folks. No. He says, go ahead and commit yourself and get married because you know you're not the kind of person that's going to be single for the rest of your life. So he says, God will get you a partner and you and that partner should be married. That's what he's saying in verse 9. Because he watched, I love what he said. He says, because it's better to marry than to burn. You know, when I was growing up in church, they, you know, because uh, most uh, preachers uh, try to translate this, it's better to marry than to burn in hell. No, that's not what he's saying there. When he says it's better to marry than to burn, it's, it's better to marry than to burn with desire to be with somebody else. Here you are, talking about I'm single, I'm single, I'm single, and you got this strong desire to be with somebody and to be in a relationship, and he says if you have that desire and the other person have that desire, go ahead and get married. There's nothing wrong with that. Then we got another problem, which brings up another issue. We talked about that, now we got to talk about engagement. That brings up engagement. So if Bible says, if the Bible says, go ahead and get married, it's better to marry than to burn with desire for the other person. How long should a couple in, be engaged before they get married? I know one church said you ought, <laughs> you ought to be engaged two years before you now see, y'all can you keep your hands off each other two weeks? And you talk about I'm engaged for two years. Then you know, well, I know one church won't even talk to you unless you commit yourself to an engagement for, for that church at least one year. You gotta go to counseling, you gotta do this for a whole year. It's better to marry than to burn. Let me tell you my experience. Uh, 23 years ago. 23 years ago, I met a young lady, uh, probably somewhere in November 1989. Uh, we didn't start dating. I said, I met her. I went talking to her. I saw she was cute and everything. And, and I'm talking about Sister Eli. I ain't talking about nobody else. I'm talking about Sister Eli. So now, now listen, 1989. And then we started dating maybe somewhere around January, February 1990. We got married in August of 1990. Uh, no, we didn't have a wedding. We went straight to Ohio, Justice of Peace. It's better to marry than to burn with desire. Now, we've been married this August be 23 years. So, but I know folks who spent $100,000 on their wedding, $50,000, 20000 30000 and they stay married two years. So guess what? If you know the person that you're with, and they are in a, and they're committed to you, what you waiting on? And then people who shack up, I can't understand them because here you are in a house living with the person, but yet you won't marry the person. And then I figure it out because this is why they won't get married. This is why people who shack up don't get married. They're living with the person, but see, they might see somebody else. And then when they see somebody else and they, the other person asks you, oh, are you, you with somebody? You, with, you married? No, no, I'm not, I'm not married. See, they can say that because they're not married. And they're living with somebody. So now you got a problem with the person you're living with. And now you're trying to meet another person. It's just going to be a big old mess in the house. So guess what? It's better to be married than to burn with desire. In other words, get with the relationship that you have. Stay with that relationship and get married. Now, if you know that this person is not marriage material, then don't get married. Move on and say, Lord, I'm praying for somebody to, you sent somebody my way. So that's group one. That's the single people. Let's talk about group number two, verse 10. Married people who are saved. Both of y'all are married. The husband and the wife is saved. Watch in verse 10. Now to the married. I command, yet not I, but the Lord. A wife is not to depart from her husband. Stop right there. So once again, remember I said, that's what the Old Testament taught. We said that. 
So now we come to the point that the New Testament teaches the same thing. Divorce is not God's way of doing things. We read in Malachi 2.16 that God hates divorce. But why do people get divorced? Christian people. God says the only reason he gives a divorce or he allows divorce is because of the hardness of people's heart and because of what? Un faithfulness. So God has allowed the other partner to be able to escape that marriage if the partner, one of the partners have committed adultery. So, now guess what? He didn't say it was a command that you get a divorce. He just said if the other person who was cheated on decides to get a divorce, they have a right to. If they want to keep that marriage, if they want to work that marriage out, that's up to them. And a lot of marriages have worked it out. But he said that is the only reason for divorce. That's why he said in verse 10 that a wife is not to depart. The Greek word for the word depart is the same word we use for divorce. She should not divorce her husband. Now, let me tell you something, but there was a problem in the Corinthian church right now before we get to verse 11. Some of them already did it. They already divorced, and he was the reason why they divorced. Remember I told you earlier, that the reason that some of these Christians got divorced was because somebody told them, if you can divorce, you need to divorce for spiritual reasons. He not on your spiritual level, and y'all need to separate and get a divorce so, so you can be more spiritual, and he can be more spiritual. And they did it. And you know, you might think that that's crazy, but I heard that same thing today. I know preachers today. I know pastors today who have divorced their wives for this reason. At least they said this reason. I, I, if I name the preacher, you'll know him in this city. But he said this to the front of his large congregation and said, uh, me and my wife, we are getting divorced for irreconcilable differences. What does that mean? Irreconcilable differences? No, there's only one reason why you should get a divorce. Then I heard another preacher say this, big time preacher said this. Well, I'm divorcing my wife because she trying to hold me back in my ministry. Okay, where's that scripture at? And we just read this verse and this passage of scripture. You can't divorce over spiritualness. That's not a reason for a divorce. You can't say, I'm divorcing my wife. Sister Elon, she's trying to hold me back. Every time I try to get a church started, she trying to hold me back. No, that, that is a wrong reason for divorce. The only reason for divorce is unfaithfulness. And that's why, watch this, verse 11 came in. Because some of them already did it. Watch what he says. But even if she does divorce, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband and a husband is not to divorce his wife. You know what he's saying here? So he said, wait a minute, if you're saved, she's saved. Y'all divorced because of spiritual reasons. If y'all still single, hopefully you are, then he says, reconcile with that person or stay, or stay single for the rest of your life. That's where that comes from. Because you got a lot of churches that try to say that you can never get remarried. No. That's not a uh, that's a false doctrine. You can get remarried if you divorce for the right reason. So we, we have that. Let's go to the third group. The third group was married people who are saved, but they are married to an unsaved person. And this unsaved person don't want to go nowhere. He wants to stay right there in the marriage. Look at verse 12 and 13. But to the rest, I... Not the Lord say, if any brother has a wife who does not believe and she is willing to live with him, let him not divorce her. And a woman who has a husband who does not believe, if he is willing to live with her, let her not divorce him. There it is. So here's another thing. Some people get saved and they got saved because you were both unsaved. And then uh, one of y'all get saved. You know there are people out there who want to divorce the unsaved person because they didn't get saved. They're not a Christian. So I, I was, he says, no. If the person wants to stay with you, you need to stay right there. Now, here's that question I told you. Some of them threw this out there. Well, if I stay with my unsaved spouse and we decide to have children, they used to think that the children are going to come out uh, mixed and going to be evil kids because I'm saved and, and he's unsaved, so we're going to have unruly and unholy kids. 
because they took 1 Corinthians 10, uh, 6, 15, which says, don't join yourself to anything that's unclean. So they thought that because their saved spouse is, so to speak, unclean, unsaved, that if they joined themselves and had children by them, that their children would become unclean. But guess what? Verse 14 cleans it all up. Look at verse 14. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean. But now, they are what? Holy. Oh, guess what? I may ask you a question. How many Christians does it take to make a house holy? One. One. If you watch this, and what does that mean? When he says a husband is sanctified by the wife, a wife is sanctified by the husband, it means this. It doesn't mean that he going to ride his wife's coattail into heaven. No, he's not saved because she's saved. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is this. If she is saved and he is not, then God is still going to pour blessings on that house because she's saved. He riding her coattail, he riding her whole blessing. And vice versa. If, 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 if he is saved and she is saved, God is still pouring down blessings on that household because of the one saved person in the household. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. Y'all know grandma was the only one saved in the family. Y'all know it was grandma and grandpa that kept the family together. Grandma told you to go to church, but nobody else told you to go to church. Everybody getting up in this house and going to church. And then when everybody was unsaved, but God still blessed your family because of grandma. You didn't know that that's why God was blessing y'all, but God kept y'all because of grandma being saved. It is the same with a husband and wife. It only it takes one of y'all to be saved for God to keep the blessings on you. Right, let me give you another example. You know how it is if, if your wife or your husband get an inheritance from a family member that passed away. Guess what? That money just as yours is, is, is hers. You will say, I thank God for Uncle Johnny. Thank God for my wife's Uncle Johnny. Guess what? I'm riding the coattail too. That inheritance is just as mine, just as much as mine as hers. So guess what? You are blessed. A wife is sanctified by her saved husband, and a saved a saved husband is sanctified by his wife. So watch what he says. Christians, we as born again believers need to understand you have the great influence in your family. But that doesn't mean that that spouse going to get saved. It don't mean that. It means this. You just be the person that God wants you to be. You know, too many people talk about, I'm waiting on the right man or I'm waiting on the right woman. Listen, when you become the right woman, God will give you the right man. When you become the right man, God will give you the right woman. You got to understand that. So when, when, when you say, well, I'm going to line myself up with God, that's all you got to do. Line yourself up with the word of God. God's going to bless you. Now, if you're already in the relationship, all you got to do is just line yourself up with the word of God. Stop all that arguing. Stop all that fighting. Somebody, man, Sherry had to say that. We had to say we have married two, in our first two years. We said, somebody got to cut this out. You got to understand, in marriage, there has to be compromise. I don't care who, look, we've been married 23 years. I already know. There's compromise in marriage. Now, when we first got married, we, 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 had, to, we had no furniture. So, we, and now we got some money, we're going to buy our first our furniture set. So, we go together to go buy this furniture set, and she picked out this, and I wanted that. So, guess what? We got to compromise. When we first bought our brand new car, she wanted this, I wanted that. Guess what? We got to compromise. Now, if I was pig-headed and bull-headed and she was pig-headed and bull-headed, we'd end up getting nothing done. We'll end up arguing, we'll end up fighting, and we, we'll end up splitting up. But if you don't believe that you need to compromise with your wife and with your husband, then that means in your relationship, what you say go, and she can't say nothing at all, or what she says go, and you can't say nothing at all, and a marriage should never be like that. Y'all supposed to come to the round table, sit down with each other, and work this thing out. You know, first thing, when I was dating my wife, you know, you know she told me, I'm telling you, we were sitting at the, at the uh, restaurant, and, you know, we were talking about uh, marriage and things like that, and she said, I just want to let you know, she said, uh, if you ever raise your hand, now, I don't even know this woman from Adam, she said, if you ever raise your hand at me, 
If you ever hit me, I'm out. It's over. Now, she told me while we were dating. Now, if y'all tell y'all daughters and girls that, that's what you should tell them and mean it. She meant what she said. Because maybe she had some past relationship where she didn't, or her mama told her don't ever accept that kind of thing from a man. And she meant it, and I never tried it. I, you know, I probably slept with one eye open. I ain't gonna try it. Look, no. I don't want no hot grits on me. I don't want no burning bed. I don't want, you know, you ain't gonna read about me on the news at all. You know, he was a good pastor, but his wife just got too tired of it and she killed. No, you ain't gonna read about us. Look, we gonna compromise today. I'm not gonna be so caught up in my anger that I'm gonna take it out of her. And see, that's where counseling comes in at. And if you might be a man or a woman, because it could be both, that have anger issues. And if you have anger issues, go get some counseling. That's why I told you, if your husband beats on you, or if your wife beats on you, or if your husband beats on the kids, or abusing the kids, no, don't divorce, but leave that house. Leave that relationship. Call Joe from down the street and tell Joe, listen, unless you get it together, I ain't coming back to the house. No, I'm not telling you I'm divorcing you. I didn't say that. I said I ain't coming back to the house. Because I know that God put us together because what God put together, let no man put asunder, right? But you won't get no help for your alcoholism. You won't get no help for your anger issues. And I'm not your punching bag. And so guess what? You are not going to continue to do this with me. And if you do, I guess we're going to be single for the rest of our life. That's the way you should look at it. I, I told you last time, guess what? Who going to give in first? Joe going to give in. Because women get hold out longer than men can. So guess what? Unless Joe just go ahead and commit adultery and let you know, now nah, she's free. She got rid of Joe anyway. And God knows she can pray for somebody else. But guess what? God is saying this. The husband, if he's saved, the wife, if she's saved, you all are sanctifying that house. So don't get upset. Now listen, don't Bob Brown beat your husband with uh, messages on his cigarette uh, case. Tell me you need Jesus. You write that on his cigarette case. You got some of his 40 ounce liquor in the, in the refrigerator. You going to hell. All this kind of stuff. You ain't got to do all that stuff because he's drinking and smoking. And you got saved. You holy now, right? You so holy and righteous. You don't do that stuff no more. But yet, you going to try to brown beat him with the Bible and tell him he if he don't live your way, then he out. you trying to nag him and you trying to make his life miserable. No way. I wonder if the unsaved one will leave the house. I'm out. I got here. I'm going to stay in this house. No, you are supposed to do what? Live a sanctified. All you got to do is live the life in front of him. Don't say no to him. Don't say, he, he might not go to church with you. He may still drink. He may still smoke. He may still cuss. He may still hang out to 3 o'clock in the morning. Don't say nothing, but I'm going to live the life that God has called me to live. And I guarantee you, when he sees that change in you, guarantee you, something is going to change in that family. Well, that's what he said, the Christian spouse becomes a channel for God's grace. Listen, Romans 11 16 says this, if the part of the dough offered as first fruit is holy, then the whole batch is holy. If the root is holy, so are the branches. So the Christian spouse provides a biblical influence in the house. And let's talk about the last group. The last group is uh, the group who are married. You're married to an unsaved person and they want to leave. Look at verse 15. Verse 15, they, they want to go. It's not time. But if the unbeliever departs, divorce, let him depart. Uh, a brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God has caused us to peace. Watch this. If he want to leave, if she want to leave, they are saved, you're, you're saved, let him go. Don't fight them. Don't talk about, no, I'm trying to save my marriage. I want to, I'm going to try to get them saved. I'm going to try to get her saved. He said, don't do it. How, how do you know he says don't do it? Because I don't know. God may save him in, in our marriage. That's why I'm trying to hold on to my marriage. If you think that way, read verse 16. For how do you know, O wife, whether you will save your husband? Where do you get that from? And how do you know, O husband, whether you will save your wife? Salvation is not up to the wife or to the husband. It's up to God. If God don't change his heart, if God don't change your heart, then it won't be changed, right? Let God deal with the salvation. And maybe after they leave, let them leave. After they leave, they'll find salvation. But my main point of telling you this, if they leave, you are free from that marriage. You can uh, get remarried. So this is what I'm saying. Remember I said the only reason for divorce 
is uh, uh, a divorce is adultery. But here's another reason: abandonment, abandonment from the unsaved spouse. So if he abandons you, I walk out of this marriage. Let him know you are set free from that marriage, and now you have the right to remarry. So we learned a lot here today, understanding about what it is to be married, what it is to be single, what is to get married, what is to remarriage. But I like to close with this. Close with the point of what does God try to show us in these four examples. He tried to show us this, that in every situation, whatever situation that God put you in physically, married, single, divorced, widowed, it doesn't matter, you should accept the situation that God has placed you in because God has allowed you to become an influence in every relationship that you have. And what do you mean? The influence that a saved, born-again believer has in his family is one of the greatest things in the world. Because if you're living the life of Jesus Christ, then God can use you, yes, to influence your family, yes, to influence your job, yes, to influence the people in your community. you got to let the power of God and the Holy Spirit rest with you so you can be an influence. Let me give you an example. It was Abraham. Abraham said this. He was praying to God one day. And God told Abraham, said, Abraham, I want you to go ahead and go ahead and get Lot. Tell Lot to get out of Sodom and Gomorrah. And because I'm about to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, because Sodom and Gomorrah is a, is a terrible, they're two terrible cities, and I'm going to destroy them. Well, Abraham began to pray. And Abraham said, God, can I ask you a question? If there's 50 people left that are righteous in the city, will you save the city? And God said, yes. Yes, Abraham, I'll save the city. And then Abraham said, well, God, don't, don't get mad with me, but if there's 40 people left in the city that are righteous, would you save the city? God said, yes, Abraham, I would save the city. He said, God, wait a minute, I got a couple more questions. If it's 20 people left in the whole city that are righteous, will you save the city? God said, yes, Abraham, I would save the city. Abraham got all the way down to 10. Say, God, don't be angry with me, but I got just one more question. If it's there 10 people that are righteous in the city of Sodom and Gomorrah, would you save the city? God said, yes, sir. Abraham, I would save the city. But all you know, the whole end of the story, Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed. I guarantee you, it wasn't even five people left in the city that were righteous. But I'm here to tell you that you are that one righteous in your family. You are that one righteous in your marriage. You are that one righteous in your relationship. So don't give up on the relationship because they may be unsaved. Don't give up on your family members because some of them may be unsaved. You are the one that is the influence. And I'm remembering, if I could, use my Holy Ghost imagination. It was Jesus. It was God the Father. The glory of the to sin. All of us are sin and come short of the glory of God. And I can see in my Holy Ghost imagination when God said, well, that's it. I got to destroy the world. But Jesus probably said, God, wait a minute. If I find just one righteous, we're just saving the world. God said, yes, but there is no righteous. Jesus said, well, God prepared me a body. I'll go. I'll be the righteous. I'll be the only one in the world who will sin. And I will save the world. He came down 42 generations. Born of a virgin named Mary. Jesus healed the sick. He raised the dead. The greatest thing, he died for your sins and my sins. But on the third day, he got up with all power in heaven and earth in his hands. Why do you get married? You need to get married because you are committed to God. You need to get married because you're committed to one another. You need to get married to show the example that God is committed to his bride, which is the body of Christ. And one of these days, it won't be long. Jesus Christ is coming back for his bride. Without the bride, without spot or wrinkle, Jesus is coming back to take us back to glory. I don't know about you, but I'm glad that Jesus is a, a husband of the church. Get married because God wants you to. Get married because you want to be committed. Get married because you want to be an influencer. Get married so you want to share the love of Christ. Let God be the head of your life and you will make that thing all right. Come on, put your hands together. Give the Lord a hand. Thank you, Lord.
every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your strength. We thank you for your peace. Thank you, Father, for allowing us to hear your word today. And there may be somebody here, Father, who don't know Jesus Christ as their Savior. And I'd like to tell you, and before we pray, that there are three ways that you can become a, a part of the family of Christian Life Baptist Church. And the first way is to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ, you never made him the Lord of your life. You never let him break your heart and say, God, what must I do to get into your kingdom? If you never made Jesus Christ your Savior, we want to pray with you today. And just raise your hand while everybody's head is bowed and every eye is closed. If you want Jesus to be the head of your life, just raise your hand right where you sit while every head is bowed. I see you, I see you where every head is bowed, every eye is closed. There's a second way to become a part of the Christian life family. That is rededication. Some of you already made Jesus Christ the head of your life. He's already the King of kings and the Lord of lords to you. But you, you strayed away. And you want to rededicate your life back to him. You want prayer. You want, Lord, I want to come back to you. I want to be recommitted. I want to my husband Christ to recommit me as part of his bride. If you are here today, just while every head is bowed and every eye is closed, if you just want to rededicate your life to Christ, raise your hand right where you sit. If you're here today and you want to rededicate your life. And there's a third way. If you want to be a part of the family of Christian Life Baptist Church, if you don't have a church home and you've been to church to church and now you want, you've been here for a while and you've been coming and you are feeling that the Holy Spirit is leading you to be a member here, then you can choose Christian Life Baptist Church as your church home. We are a church that's going to teach you the word of God verse by verse. We're going to teach you on Tuesdays and Sundays. And we thank God that we can, uh, he can use us to help build you up in his grace. If you're here today and you don't have a church home and you want Christian life to be that church home, just raise your hand while every head is bowed and every eye is closed. Amen. Amen. I see your hand. Amen. Come on, let's put God. Put your hands together. Give the Lord a hand. God, praise. Those who raise your hand, please come down uh, to us. Oh, you two come. Yeah, come on down. And the young lady back. Come on to the come on to the front. Amen. We thank God for you. Stay right there. We're going to pray. I'm going to pray with you um, because she came down for salvation. You came down for uh, membership. And Sister Eli, can you get with me? These are the two cards for membership. So we thank God for you. Thank you, God, for, for coming and joining today. We thank God for you. We're going to pray for you um, for joining Christian Life Baptist Church, and then we're going to get some information for you. So let us all bow our heads for a word of prayer, and then we're going to have our heart to call prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you once again for these, your people, who have come today, Father, accepting Jesus Christ as their Savior. And in the name of Jesus, Father, we give your name the praise and glory. You said that the angels in heaven are rejoicing over one sinner that turns their life over to you, and they are rejoicing. Father, these two, Father, have come to you as humble as they know how. They're crying out from their hearts. They're crying out from their spirits, Father, that they want that connection with you right now in the name of Jesus. And we thank you, Father, that they have made that connection today by joining us and becoming a member here of this church. And we give your name to praise. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Come on, let's put your hands together. You God. Thank God. Praise you. Thank God. Praise you. So you God is going to uh, get your information. Oh, no, we have yours already, right? Do we have both of y'all? We have yours too? Okay, good. That's great. But stay right here. I want to now offer, uh, let's all stand. It's all to call time for us. And this is the time where we want to pray for you. Now, I want to do a special prayer on those who are married and those who want to get married. So, I want them to come first. If you are married and you want to pray for your relationship, come on down. If you want to get married and you want to pray for your relationship, let's come on down first. I want you to spread it around that way. Spread, yeah, go further that way. That's half the building. Oh, Lord. <laughs> Y'all come on here. Come on down. Come on around this way. We're going to pray good. So we're going to do a special special prayer for the married couples and the 